Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming. I'd like to introduce Dr. George Zug. He's gonna be speaking to us today. He works at the Smithsonian Institution um, in the Department of Vertebrate Zoology, the Division of Amphibians and Reptiles. His current research interests are herpetology, biology, and systematics of amphibians and reptiles. He's currently focused on the systematics of the herpetofauna of Oceanana in Oceania in Burma. And today he's gonna to be speaking to us about the anatomy and the biology of local and foreign snakes, as well as snake-human interactions. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me back there? I'll try to keep my voice up, but since I'm probably going to wander around, uh, I want to try to keep the voice up rather than stand strictly at the podium. I also want to make this a fairly informal talk, lecture, or discussion, whichever way you wish to label it. And so I want you to feel free to interrupt me if you have a question, or preferably a question. Sometimes the comments I could do with that. Uh, but on that note, sincerely, I would, do not mind answering questions while I'm going. And one of the things that you'll find that while I have a sort of formally prepared talk, I much prefer to simply look down occasionally at my notes to make certain that I haven't forgotten something. But otherwise, we're just simply going to talk about snakes. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but there are about 2,900 species of snakes. This is relative to some groups of animals, fairly diverse groups, and particularly when you consider the fact that we're dealing with animals that have largely no limbs, or at least limbs that you can't see. The adaptations that you see within snakes is very, very wide. And one of the things that I'm going to present is give you some ideas of what these adaptations are, how the snakes make their livings, and things of this sort. But one of the things I want to start with is just to introduce you to the three major topics or areas that I'm going to cover. We're going to take a look at local snakes and in general snake diversity. Then I'm going to talk about making a living without limbs. And this is going to really be the portion where we're looking at the adaptations of snakes and how you do indeed, uh, if you are limbless, go about making a living. And then we'll finish up with snake-human interactions. And not all snake-human interactions are bad. The first thing to do is to point out to you where snakes occur. All the colored areas are, have at least one snake species. In many cases, we're talking about far more than one species. The colored codes are green for where a snake occurred or where snakes occur, but none of them are venomous. The yellow, one venomous species occurs in that area. And red, two or more venomous species occur. Let's point out a couple of things on this before we go off of it. Obviously, we're in Virginia, and you can see that we are in the red. So that means we have at least two venomous species. But I also want to point out the fact is, is that some of the snakes are fairly cold tolerant. This is a European viper, pit viper, actually not pit viper, <coughs> viper. And that is occurring and living north of the Arctic Circle. So you can imagine that it's probably during its li annual lifetime or life, it is exposed or active, active for perhaps no more than all two, maybe three at most months out of every year. Well, the other thing, well, yes, interrupt. I'm sorry, I have a question. What's up with New Zealand? No snakes. And why it was never connected to land mass. Oh, okay. If you, I don't know how your geology is, but this portion uh, as well as Australia and such were all very southern before the continent started to break up. And in the case of New Zealand, it never has a land connection and it has it's always this is fairly cold area as well too. The point that you're seeing here is, is that there is one 
perhaps two species of sea snakes that occur throughout this area, but definitely there's one. And obviously its name is the pelagic sea snake, because in point of fact, it is entirely pelagic. Now, for the snakes that we have locally, we have 17 species of snakes here in the Leesburg area. And of those, I would suspect that maybe not half, but certainly a third of the snakes aren't even seen by even the most ardent naturalist when it, they're looking for them, because some of them are really hard to find. They're living underneath uh, rocks, logs, leaf litter, and things of that sort. I'm not going to list the, the relative size, but I do want you to take a look at that and look at the relative size of the snakes in this area. You'll see that there are a group of very small ones. Those are adult size, and those are maxima for Virginia snakes. Now, let's take a look at some of the smaller ones. We have three that are reasonably common, and I suspect if you really got out and rooted in your local woodlot or something like this, you may find these. Well, at least you'd find the top two. This is called the, well, this is the rough earth snake, ring neck snake, and Carphophis. Excuse me, when it comes to common names, I have to stop and think a bit. Uh, the worm snake. Uh, this is important in fact. The worm snake is, its diet consists mainly of worms. Surprise, surprise. All of these are forest four uh, denizens, living underneath logs, rocks, and leaf litter and things like that. They're all of them being very small, and here's where I need to check my notes to make certain that I have the sizes right. Maximum size, 11 inches for the worm snake, 13 for the rough earth snake, and about 20 inches for the ringneck snake. Totally innocuous. All of them eat earthworms. Oh, the ring snake will occasionally eat salamanders and things of that sort. Now remember, it's somewhat larger than the other two, so you would expect that it might be able to eat small vertebrates. These two lay eggs, something on the order of all two to six eggs. Got it right, yes. Uh, the eggs uh, are laid roughly at this time of the year up into uh, late June. They're going to take something on the order of six to seven weeks to hatch. Uh, and then what you wind up with are real tiny snakes, because we're starting with a small snake to begin with. The Earth snake is a live bear. It gives birth to small snakes. And so what it has is a pregnancy or a gestation period that it runs sort of eight to 10 weeks. And if they're mating roughly at this time of the year, then they're going to be giving birth sometime in August to early September. Okay. Of our local snakes, the ones that are seen probably most frequently are the black snakes. Well, except maybe if you live along a pond or a stream, then the water snake, the northern water snake, may be your most common snake. But these are two separate species. You have the, the black racer, the black rat. Both of them have white chins. But if you look, you'll see that the black rat is white totally underneath, whereas as soon as you get into the body of this one, it is dark gray to black. The other thing is, is once you have them in hand, if you're so inclined, that is in hand, not dead, but alive, you would look at the body shape of this one, and you would see that it is actually round, which is fairly common for snakes. In contrast for the rat snakes, if you were to look at it and cross section and such, it would look like a slice of bread. The bottom of it is very, very flat. And part of the reason for this as an adaptation is by having a flat bully or venter, what it does is it gives the scales where the body comes down sort of an edge. 
And the advantage of this edge is, is that of all our snakes locally, this is one of our best climbers. And it really can climb very, very rapidly. Uh, obviously to the detriment of birds in the nest and things of that sort, because both of them eat birds and small mammals. But this at this time of the year, would certainly, a bit early, would be a, certainly a specialist on the birds. Uh, the thing about the black racer is, is that it has a wider or more catholic diet and it will eat things like uh, cicadids and grasshoppers and earthworms and things of that sort. But both of them are principally uh, mammal eaters and, and in this case, add birds to that list. They're also our biggest snakes. And it's not uncommon to see them going through your backyard and see a snake that is four feet, five feet long. Now my favorite of the local snakes is the hognose snake. These are all the same species. These are all hognose snakes. They are a number of reasons that they're hognose. I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but in this one perhaps, you can see that the snout is sort of shovel shaped. Part of that shovel shape is because it is a burrow, or more often than not, you're going to find it in areas where the soil is fairly soft. One of the things about the hognose snakes are is that they are really, how do I want to put this, bluffers, great bluffers, because the point is is that, and also it gets them killed, but the thing is is to protect them from their natural predators, which would be birds and mammals, is, is that they put on an incredible show when they're disturbed. And you see this one here doing it, and certainly it does not look as though it's a, innocuous snake, but it certainly is. Because it flattens its head, it hisses, and things of that sort. If it bites, more often than not, when it's striking, I shouldn't say when it bites, when it strikes, it often strikes with its mouth closed. So even if it were to be up and you'd go to pick it up and it struck at you, you would be hit by the nose of the snake rather than the teeth. But don't count on it occurring 100% of the time. Uh, the other thing is, okay, my bluffing has not paid off, so what am I going to do? I'm going to roll over and play dead. I'm going to play a possum. And if you were to take this snake and roll it back, it doesn't have enough sense to stay right side up. It will roll itself back. <laughs> and as yet, no one really has given a good explanation of why playing dead works. But hognose snakes aren't the only snake species that do it. And of course, there are mammals, possums play dead, and some of the other things too. So there must be something associated with a predator that if it goes to attack something that's fairly active and all of a sudden flops over dead, it stops. There has to be some adaptive reason for it. Now, we have two other local snakes. Both of them, well, this is the northern banded water snake, the northern water snake, and this is our local garter snake. Both of these are related to one another, although not particularly closely, in the fact that we're talking about millions of years of separation, but nonetheless, they are still related to one another, the same family. The water snake is aptly named in that you are very seldom going to find it. Uh, somewhere outside of on the stream or pond or things of this sort. And while you're going to find the garter snake in moist areas and things of that sort, you also find them in your backyard, grassy areas, things of that nature as well. Both of them tend to eat amphibians, principally frogs or toads. And of course, in the water snake, we're dealing uh, also with eating fish. Both of them also are live bears in the sense that they give, once again, they get pregnant, they have fetus in them. The interesting thing here is, is that for this group, the natricine snakes, the fetuses actually have placenta, and the placenta are mammal-style placenta. So there is indeed within, actually within snakes and in some of the lizards, you have, I think there's close to a half a dozen different sorts of placenta that have been developed. 
and some of them, and these are independently within different snake lines, and of course they're independent from mammals. But in many cases, because embryologically you only have a limited number of structures to deal with, you have some species, such as the natricines, that have a placenta that is developed from the same embryonic structures. Yes, ma'am. Is there a correlation between uh, uh, embryonic rather than egg laying and, uh, and whether or not the, the sphinx are constrictor or, 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 or well, uh, The reason I stopped and thought I was going to say, well, I still think I can say, and you know, in biology, you never say anything is always or ever. Uh, most of your constrictors, at least in the colubrid snakes, yeah. are egg layers, thinking about it. Uh, that's a family of snakes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, versus boas and pythons. Now, remember, most of the pythons are egg layers. They are, they're constrictors, but boas are all give, have uh, live bears, and of course, they are very, very good constrictors. So, the, there may be something there, at least in some of the groups, but I don't know if it holds. Uh, just to give you an idea, one of the advantages of carrying uh, embryos is, is that many of the things that carry embryos have incredibly large clutches. Because I think in both the garter snake and the water snake, there are clutches up to 55 embryos within there. So I mean, you, it's not that you can't lay that many eggs, but apparently carrying the fetuses around, you can carry more. And it's certainly true of some of the smaller snakes, the, these smaller species. The ones that have the, that get pregnant, tend to have more fetuses than those that lay eggs. Once again, not 100%, but something on that side. Now we have two venomous species in Virginia. We have the copperhead, and I'll show you in a bit the rattlesnake. The copperhead is indeed has a coppery head. The other thing that it also has for identifying it and separating it from all other Virginia snakes, and certainly in this area, is these markings. They're dumbbell shaped. See the broader on the bottom versus there on the side. You'll see this again. Let me see what else I need to tell you about that. Yes. That one is climbing a tree. It is? Yes. Uh, Proof positive. <laughs> <laughs> no, this slide. It came to me from a uh, Boy Scout leader who had his troop down in North Carolina. They were camped out at a state park. And one of the boys said he heard something peculiar up in the tree. And he got out his camera and the light. And they watched it. And I have another picture where it's higher up. So the point of fact, yeah. Now, not that it's going to climb up there and wait for you to walk underneath so it can drop on you. That's not the case. but. The chances are what it was doing is it was, may have been following a mouse trail or something of that sort. Uh, copperheads in general have a more catholic, broader diet than do rattlesnakes, where rattlesnakes are going to be principally on mammals and to some extent birds. <coughs> the rattlesnake or the copperhead will eat those as well too, uh, but it's also going to eat some of the frogs and other, I don't know, Certainly, as a young, it would eat uh, insects and things of that sort. What other notes do I have on it? It is a live bear, and it gives three to 15 young uh, birth to three to 15 young after about 10 weeks of pregnancy. The, the point that I can make here is, is that all pit vipers, with the exception of one, give birth whereas all the vipers, those in Europe and, well, the things that are called vipers versus pit vipers, uh, are all egg layers, or almost all egg layers. Well, obviously, 
one of the reasons for showing a copperhead is, is that any snake that is seen by people who don't know snakes is immediately a copperhead, is immediately bludgeoned, and things of that sort. And of course, uh, in very few instances do they kill, actually, a copperhead. Now, it's, I'm not saying that we don't have, if you're out here in this area of Leesburg and you're in a small woodlot walking around, there certainly is a possibility that you're going to run across a copperhead. But more likely, you're going to run across something else. One of the hognose snakes, a corn snake. And in this case, this is a young black, have to look at it, young black uh, racer. But the black rat snake also is has a pattern as a juvenile as well, too. Just to re-emphasize, look at the spots. And you don't have to get up close to see that they're dumbbell shaped. You don't have to get your nose to nose to see whether it has a pit on the side of its face or something of that sort. Yeah. I don't, but that, I mean, it, this is not an area that, well, I live here and have done some things on the snakes here. Yeah, I, you'd have to ask. We have within Virginia a very good uh, herpological society. It's the Virginia Herpological Society. Anyway, the, you know, it's not, one of the areas that I pay a lot of attention and such to. So I, I can't say whether they're recent or not. Uh, the timber, timber rattler. This is a species that if you get a little bit further west from here or a little bit further south in the sense of Bull Run Mountain, there's a population. Uh, you were talking about Sugarloaf, was it? In Maryland, where we have some isolated populations. The timber rattler is a Appalachian mountain snake until you get further south and then its distribution spreads eastward to the coastal plains and there it's called the cane break. They're all the same species. This is an endangered species. It's an endangered species because it has an incredibly slow reproductive rate. Females get pregnant about every three or four years Part of that reason for the slowness is, is that, one, development is as long, but also when they are pregnant, the female does not feed. So obviously there's an extended period of time, well over a year, where the, or close to a year, that the female is not breeding. And obviously she's putting her energy into raising the embryos uh, and also just simply surviving so that when she finally gives birth, she has to start eating and regain all those resources for her body so that she can get pregnant again. So hence, in many slow reproducing animals, the slow reproduction is, is because of the energy the female has had to expend to produce those young. Now, the question of course is, is I said endangered and I suspect some of you go, so what? It's a venomous snake. What do we care whether or not uh, it goes extinct or not? Well, from my perspective, obviously, there is the moral perspective in that every species has a right to life. So you have that side. But there's also, as far as humans are concerned, a very much an economical side to keeping all species of snakes alive, and particularly keeping things like uh, rattlesnakes and copperheads and black rat snakes alive. They eat rodents. They eat mice. Okay, so you live in a house, why do you care about a uh, snake out in the woods eating mice or something of that sort? Well, from one perspective is, is obviously you don't want to have, well, let's just call it the economy of nature. You want to try to keep it balanced. So you want to keep the mouse population low, to get rid of snakes and other predators such as hawks and things like that. Mouse populations get higher. Okay, so what do you care about a mouse population being high out in the woods? Well, I suspect most of you here enjoy going out for weekend walks and things in the woods. When you do that, are you concerned about Lyme's disease? Well, the point is that mice in many populations, about 
of the mice are infected with the Lyme bacteria, much more so than the deer. So it is the mice that are actually spreading the Lyme disease or maintaining its population level. So hence, there is a reason for, quote, supporting the economy and nature, not knocking off all the uh, predators and things of that sort. Another question before. I don't know of any. In general, the answer would be no, unless it was not treated at all and the person got a secondary infection bite. Copperhead bites are not particularly toxic to your physiological system, but if you've seen anyone with a copperhead bite, you know you don't want to be bitten because they have very necrotic venom. And so the area where you are bitten, you lose muscle, skin, everything in that area. You get these monstrous, and nasty looking wounds. And when they heal, obviously, if it went deep enough, it is digested ligaments or tendons, and maybe damaged nerves and things of that sort. So, you know, adequate treatment, you're probably going, you're not going to die from it, but you probably are going to wind up with some sort of nasty scar. It's one of the things when dealing with herpetologists. You usually can tell those who are really big into snakes. My hands are more or less normal. I have arthritis, so it may look a little peculiar that way. But you deal with what I label snake freaks. Often when you shake a hand, what you feel is a finger that's missing, or one that's curled up, or something like that. Because they've been bitten by a snake, and the, the finger or whatever doesn't come back and act normally thereafter. So, okay. Off, see, one of the reasons why you have to keep me on track. Uh, I have two uh, points that I want to make relative to snake stories in Virginia. One of them is, is that the water snakes that we have in this area are not water moccasins, are not hot. Yes, Virginia has cottonmouths and water moccasins, but they don't have them in this area. The closest voucher or known population of water moccasins, and it's the same thing when you say cottonmouth, is on the James River south of Richmond and in the Dismal Swamp. We have this guy. This is a water snake I showed you previously. He is big, when he gets mad, his head flattens. When you disturb him too much, he strikes. And he doesn't strike with a closed mouth. He strikes with his mouth open. And I assure you, if you're bitten by him, you know it. But what is he doing? He's protecting himself. He's not envenomating you. If he rears back and you see the white inside his mouth, yeah, snake mouths are white inside. So that doesn't make him a cotton mouth. Not here. And don't believe anybody that tells you that they saw one on the Potomac, because they didn't. One of the other uh, snake stories that goes around, and it actually didn't, have, I got in the Virginia area, moved to the Smithsonian in late 1968. Uh, at that point in time, this story didn't exist. It seemed in the early 70s it came up. Now, whether it, persisted somewhere or came from somewhere else or started here, I don't know. But the story came that rattles, rattlesnakes and black snakes, and of course they're not specifying whether it's a black racer or a black rat, are hybridizing. And of course what they're doing is, is they're producing venomous young. Excuse my French, bullshit. The point is that evolutionarily the group that gave rise to the vipers separated from the group that eventually gave rise to our colubrid snakes and other things back in the Cretaceous. We're talking at least 60 million years ago. So there is a fair amount of genetic difference between the two. I will admit the fact that we see, we have zebras and horses that interbreed uh, or horses and mules, or occasionally they, what they have, they do a tiger-lion thing and they get it, a lion-tiger. But the point is, you should never see a lion breed with a horse, producing, say, a carnivorous mule, or a lion with hooves, 
Well, they are genetically more similar to one another, the lion and the horse, than are the rattlesnakes and the black snakes and things. So once again, here's a myth that is really a stretch of the imagination. Another question. Oh yeah, no, they, they do look in some places rattlesnakes and black snakes. Well, I don't honestly, I, I, that I don't know. That, Well, my guess is, is I suspect that rattlesnakes and copperheads, quotes, had enough sense to find the, the dens without the other ones. Now, I'm really running on. I, as you see, I can get to be uh, very much of a motor mouth. So feel free if you've had enough of me to get up and leave. I'm not going to shut up for a while. Let's take the first portion dealing with snake adaptations and let's look at the question, what makes a snake a snake? First off, the legless lizard you see there is a lizard lizard. It is not a snake. If you were close enough and or this was clear enough, you'd see it had an eyelid. But these are a whole series of characteristics that will tell you when you have a lizard and when you have a snake in hand. No eyelids, no external ear openings, rudimentary or no limbs, because now remember now, in uh, pythons and or in boids, they have what's called a spur back close to the vent, and that is actually a rudimentary hind limb. Uh, generally, most snakes that you're familiar with will have flexible upper and lower jaws. Almost all snakes, that, once again, that you are familiar with will have very large belly scales, and all the snakes you're familiar with usually or do have keratinized fork tongue tips. So anything that we have in this area, if you use that list, you can easily tell that it's a lizard or a snake. Yes, ma'am. Keratinized is your fingernails, toenails, hooves, and things like that. Yeah, yeah it's keratin. Excuse me. Now let's take a look at if we're making a living without limbs. And we're going to take a look at senses, locomotion, prey capture, and eating. Snakes have all the abilities, sensory abilities that you have. They can smell, they can see, they have tactile or seismic sense. Wait, wait, I'm gonna, let me get my list so I don't make anything else. If I didn't say hearing, they do hear. And that's an important thing. And the other one, the special sense they have, but not all of them, is an if being able to see by infrared vision. We'll get to that in a little bit later. This snake, this is a cane break. And what it has done, and this is a natural posture, it has located the fact that there is a mouse trail on here, there. It's located that mouse trail by the fact that it smelled the mouse trail. Now it is actually waiting in ambush for a mouse to come running along this. And it will know that the mouse is coming because it has its chin on the log, so it will feel the vibration. So it has this tactile seismic sense that it's going to do. It is a rattlesnake, which means that it has two types of vision. It has standard light vision like you or my eye, but it also has its pit, its infrared vision for the pit thing. So it's going to see the mouse as the mouse is coming towards it. And in both cases, the eyes, the normal light vision and the infrared vision are binocular. So it uses that so it can aim at strike. When the mouse runs past, it will strike out, bite the mouse. When it, its mouth goes over the when the snake's mouth goes over the mouse, it will have the tactile vision knowing that it's where it's supposed to be, at which point it will inject venom and retract and then rest while the mouse goes staggering off. It will not follow that, in most cases, it won't follow the mouse immediately. And it will wait for the venom to begin to take effect. Then it will start to track the mouse and it will track the mouse by smell. 
but it does uses the tongue, and we're going to get to that in a moment. Okay, vision. They do have good eyes. They do see. They have principally rods in their eye. I don't know how many of you have. Within an eye, you have sensory receptors that are called rods and cones. Rods are ones that are responsible for black and white vision, and they are also able to pick up light at low intensity, so they're quite useful at night. But apparently, they don't give you a very fine vision. Cones give you sharper resolution. Now, cones are also the one cells, the visual cells that we have in our eyes that allow us to see color. But to see color, you need different visual pigments in each cone. Well, the thing is, the cones within a snake's eye all have the same visual pigment. So the likelihood of them seeing color is slight. The other thing that I need to point out here is, is that you have brown pupils, elliptical pupils. Elliptical pupils are very, very common in nocturnal snakes, browns, and diurnal snakes. And functionally, the reason for an elliptical pupil is not for it being closed in the light, but for the iris, when it opens, it can open wider by being this sort of sliding situation, whereas the round pupil, it's a constriction thing. So it cannot open as wide. And so that's a functional explanation for the evolution of elliptical versus uh, round pupils. The other thing I want to point out in this, I talked about infrared receptors in the pit vipers. Well, there are a number of other snakes that have them. In this emerald tree boa, you'll see there are a whole series of pits there, and those are indeed infrared. At the base of them, there's a membrane that has a cell, and it actually can sense infrared. Vision. It senses heat differential is what we're really talking about. The point is, it's almost all, at least all the snakes that I can think of that have infrared receptors, have them so arranged that they're binocular, just in the sense of, in many cases, the eyes are the same. I mean, you, just one thing. If you look at a snake or something like that, or look at any animal, if you look at it from head on and you can see both eyes, just remember that snake has de or animal has depth perception because if you can see both eyes, it can see straight forward, and so it has overlapping visual fields. And if you have an overlapping visual field, you wind up with depth perception, binocular vision. Your question. No. No. I mean, it works here, but don't count on it if you go to Costa Rica or somewhere else. All right. The other thing, let's just briefly talk about the tongue. I talked about a keratinized tongue. Well, when you look at the snake tongue, you see it's black. Well, it's black because of the characterization, uh, which means it has a very hard, smooth surface, which also indicates that it doesn't have any taste buds. Well, point of fact, very few, if any snakes, have taste buds. They have lost them. Now, snakes use their tongue to smell, but they don't smell with their tongue. Now, let me make my point here. Snake tongue is forked. You see it going in and out. And what it's doing is when it comes out, it picks up century, let's call them odor particles. And it brings those particles back and it touches them to the roof of the mouth. And there they are moved into a special outpocketing of the standard olfactory tissue, what thing is called the vomeronasal organ. And so what the tongue is doing is it's picking up sort of the heavier odor particles, not the ones that necessarily are floating in the air because it does have a nose and it does Air goes in that way, so it can smell or get air and sense into the actual olfactory thing. But for the heavier particles, and in large part when I was talking about the snake uh, tracking a 
mouse, it's going to use those heavier particles to find the mouse. Also in reproduction, they tend to use the tongue as well to pick up the particles that are able to a male to track a female. Locomotion. This is a little bit tougher to explain from just verbally as such. But typical of snakes, you have undulatory, crawling, serpentine locomotion, whatever you want to call it. And it's easier to start with and talk about the, what amounts to being. This is an aquatic locomotion, although in this case, the snake is stranded on the shoreline. But the point is, if you were to look at the knee or any elongated fish, you would see that when it's swimming, it forms very smooth curves. It forms smooth curves because alternately, there are muscle contractions of the body that move down. And so this wave, if you were to watch, you would see that this sort of would flatten out. But the whole thing is that when it's swimming, the curves, the outside of these curves, the whole thing, are pushing against the water that propel it forward. Now in terrestrial motion, you never see, or you very seldom see, a snake crawling across a road or on a trail or something in which it is this shape. It may have some curves in it, but more often than not, it just has irregular curves. The thing is that here there is no wave of muscular contraction moving back across the body. The other thing is that in a snake crawling on the ground and such, every point of that snake is going to cross there. In other words, it's like a locomotive pulling a, a string of cars. They all follow the same path. So this piece of the tail is eventually going to pass right in there. In other words, as the snake crawls, these little curves, the tail tip will fall over that same path. Now why is that occurring? Because in a terrestrial locomotion, you only have pushing from the con certain or limited number of contact points. I'm using this as an example. If this were terrestrial, the snake would be pushing from just this area, outside of the curve, there, 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 and perhaps there. And if this were terrestrial, that entire body would pass through in that same curve. Now, I don't know whether this will make it a bit clearer or not. Sidewinders are, in point of fact, following the same basic undulatory locomotion. If you look, you can see that they have this sort of cleft-shaped ridge where they touched. And what's thrown up is the sand on the outside of the curve where the body was pushing against. So that this is beginning to start here. Well, the head, let me just back up. There are usually are only two points of contact. This snake actually, no, it only has two because you can see the head's lifted up. The body is in contact right there because it's beginning to create this ridge and it has pushing off where its tail's at. So what the snake largely is doing, it's holding a major portion of its body up, touching it down two places, and it always has to have it on two places, sometimes it can be three. But it's only pushing here on the outer edge. And that's true of just regular locomotion as well, too. In arboreal locomotion, you can have the same sort of crawling. If there's lots of branches and surfaces and such that the snake can touch and rest on, it can push from those and move almost at the same speed as if it were on the ground. The picture I'm showing you here is where there are a few contact points. And so what this snake is going to do is it's on one, it's going to stretch across to another one, sort of lay its head on that stick or limb, whatever there, and then slowly draw the rest of the body across so that it's on that surface. Under these circumstances, the snake can keep sort of a steady forward locomotion, but it's very small or very slow. Whereas if there were lots of branches and such, it could move at almost the same speed as it could on the ground. The point is, is if you have no limbs, how do you catch something? You bite it. So that's the way snakes catch their prey, by biting. 
There is one single exception, one snake, that is capable of using its scales. This is the elephant snake of Southeast Asia and such. It has very, well, scales sort of each have a thorn or barb on it. And as a fish swims past, it can actually loop itself and not constrict so much, but loop itself against the fish and hook on and give it time to turn around and bite. Everybody else bites. Once they bite, some snakes will immediately begin to swallow, most don't. When you're catching prey, many prey, in point of fact, are dangerous. And if you're not careful, if you're being a snake in that sense, the teleological sense, if you're not careful, the prey can help injure you and perhaps kill you as well too. So the point is, is you want to come up with a behavioral mechanism that allows you to catch prey and catch prey safely. And there are two major ways of doing it if you're dealing with dangerous prey. Well, obviously the skink isn't too dangerous to this king snake. You bite and you throw corals around it and you constrict it. The other uh, method is, is you bite it, inject venom, and back off and wait for the thing to die. Now, I'm only going to talk about constriction. Let me just see where I'm at here in my slides. Yeah. In constriction, <laughs> constriction is not a process whereby you suffocate your prey. It is not a process whereby you crush the prey. Constriction is actually a method of squeezing the body so tight and particularly the area around the heart that you cause the heart to stop pumping. In other words, the pressure on it is so great. And as soon as you, at least if you don't even stop the pumping, you at least cause it to become arrhythmatic. Under those circumstances, the blood flow to the brain slows down or it may actually stop. If there's no blood, there's no oxygen in the brain, and brain cells die very, very quickly. In point of fact, this method of constricting and reducing the blood flow or eliminating the blood flow to a prey kills the thing faster than if it was attempting to suffocate it. And this is relatively new, I would say, last 15 years or so ago, and it has been proven by people putting pressure gauges in prey and checking it out that way. But yes, a big snake swallowing something may squeeze it and break a rib or something, but that's not the problem the main cause of the death. The death is caused by bringing uh, blood flow to the brain down and stopping, basically stopping the prey because your prey becomes brain dead, at which point you consume it. Let's take a look at uh, snake eating. And I have obviously a skull here, but one of the things I want to point out first is that all of you are well aware of the fact that we talk about snakes eating prey bigger than they are. Well, obviously, it's not can't eat something bigger than they are if they can't swallow it. But they are adaptable in that you see these white lines. Well, that's the skin between the scales. So this body has expanded, and it's expanded because of the prey moving down through. The other thing that has occurred, and this is harder to see here, but we'll go over here, is that. First off, well, let me just come over here. If you look, you see that the upper jaw, which is here, they're separated. If you were to look at the lower jaw and top view or ventral view, you'd see it separated. So it has spread out this way. In addition, the head has, the upper jaw has swung a little bit. It's not as mobile as the lower jaw, has swung out. But definitely, the lower jaw swings way out. Now, I don't have it here, but what happens is, this, the quadrate bone, this is what the lower jaw is hinged to, normally is something like this. When it starts to eat prey, it swings out. So that's widening the mouth, and it can widen the mouth in the rear, and the fact that here, and I remember it's the lower jaw that's important, they're not joined together like you or my jaw, it can spread too. So it easily can handle that mouse, then to get the mouse to move along, it uses what I will call uh, either ratcheting or jaw locking. If you look at this skull, I tried to show it to you. 
one side of the skull of the teeth is anterior to the other side. And so what happens is, is while this side of the jaw, say the left side of the jaw, is anchored, has the teeth firmly in the prey, the opposite side, the right side, releases its grip, shifts forward, then bites, anchors itself, at which point it then starts moving itself back, muscle action. And while that's occurring, the left side looses its grip, moves forward. And so what the jaw is literally doing is going like that. And so what it's doing is walking the head over the prey. And as it's walking the head over the prey, it's driving the body of the prey down into the gullet. Once it gets far enough down, then it has to use its body motion and things like that to move it further down through the esophagus into the stomach. Snake-human interactions. There are lots of them, and more often than not, the interactions that occur are really detrimental to the snake. Who's feeling worse here, the human or the snake? My contention is, is that the snake is not happy that the guy has stuck it up its nose. I want to, two topics that I want to cover. Uh, one is invasive species, and the primary one we'll talk about is the brown tree snakes. And as one of our audience member here has already informed me, this is about keeping snakes as pets, but you can see my pet expression is absolutely not. So for those of you who have children who want to have a snake as a pet, tell them no. And the other thing is, is we're going to touch on snake bite, but we'll do it very, very superficially. This, by the way, is a brown tree snake occurring naturally in a shower in Guam. I don't know whether you would like that to be natural, but that in point of fact is the snake was there on its own. It wasn't put there as a uh, prop to be shown. One of the, m well, horrendous invasive stories is in point of fact the brown tree snake on Guam. You, you don't know where Guam is? <laughs> Sometime, probably immediately after the Second World War, when the US military was moving its supplies from New Guinea and probably from the Admiralty Islands, it packed up among its bulldozers and other sorts of military things a couple of brown tree snakes. And it moved all its supplies to Guam. And for years, in fact, it wasn't until the mid-50s that we actually got a record of a specimen of the brown tree snake in Guam. So we knew that it was there, but it wasn't in large numbers. In the mid-60s, then they started to become more common. And one of the things that people started to notice by the late 70s and early 80s, there were almost no birds. Because the brown tree snake as an adult, its principal prey is bray, birds. It eats uh, lizards and geckos and things like that. And point of fact, the brown tree snake has largely eliminated the birds from Guam. I mean, there have been major efforts. Our Conservation Research Center has a program going where it's raising Guam rails to release not back on Guam because they haven't gotten rid of the uh, brown tree snakes. Brown tree snakes are a real problem. Now, they're an economical problem in the sense that they eat people's chicken, they occasionally bite, they are mildly venomous, so there are those sorts of problems. But the major problem, the things that brought the real attention to this and also brought the money to fund herpetologists doing research is, is these are big snakes. At the, naturally, they're in New Guinea they occur maybe up to seven, seven and a half feet. Early on in Guam, because they had no predators and plenty of food, they were reaching 10 feet. Now, imagine, because they are tree snakes, that they like to climb up electric power structures. You get up to the top of the structure and you want to go somewhere, so you're on one lifeline, electric line, and you stretch across to another. You create a short. If 
process being you, you're a fried snake. But at the same time, what you've done is you've knocked the power out. Well, the military happens to have, or Guam happens to be a major military base and monitoring what's all going on in the Pacific. But when your power's out and all your detection equipment goes down, it becomes a serious problem. Hence, they started putting money in to find out what you could do about snakes. Well, we haven't gotten rid of them yet, but you can in certain areas build snake-proof fences. So, I mean, gives you an idea. This is uh, something on the order of probably 10 feet high. You're keeping it reasonably well mowed. It's relatively straight. The fencing up in this area won't allow a standard size snake through, but more importantly, it has an overhang. And so even if the snake's coming up and trying to crawl, it can't get enough leverage. And so once it gets up here, it falls off. The point is, is the brown tree snake is still a major pest and there is great concern that it will be moved out of Guam into other areas. And the problem is, is that Guam is a major military supply depot and shipping point as well it has also become a major public or business uh, center for shipping throughout the Pacific. And so what's happening now is, is that all cargo coming out of Guam has to be fumigated kill the brown tree snake. And what has driven this more than anything else is, is that there is concern that the brown tree snake will get to Hawaii. And so obviously Hawaiians don't want brown tree snakes. And they don't want brown tree snakes because they're snakes, but because they will cause a major economic catastrophe. In fact, the USDA has recently estimated that at a minimum, the brown tree snake becomes established in Hawaii, that there will be $100 million expense every year. And there is certainly a possibility that it, the annual expense for having this introduced species in your area, it may, in Hawaii, may be as much as a billion dollars, depending on whether or not you want to believe economists, and then after this past year or so, you don't really want to believe economists anyway. Uh, yes? Yeah, I mean, the brown tree snake has, they've recorded from uh, Diego Garcia that it has gotten there. As far as I know, it has not become established. They have gotten up in Hawaii at the various, at Pearl Harbor and some of these other areas. And I would not be surprised if there is a resident, a resident population on Hawaii. And the only way it's going to really be is to get high enough so that people start seeing what's well, there. Uh, just side relative to uh, invasive species. Hawaii, before humans arrived, there were no amphibians or reptiles there. There are now 35 species of amphibians and reptiles in Hawaii. And brown tree snake is one that they don't want. They have the Puerto Rican uh, coqui, which is a little frog, but its numbers are so high that it keeps people away from it, so they don't like it either. I've got a question about it. Uh, in the national habitat, there are probably other snakes, uh, maybe parasites and things of that sort, but nowhere. It occurs throughout the beginning in northern Australia. And it's not an uncommon snake, but it's not an overly common snake. So it's likely other <laughs> snakes, and because neither of those areas have major uh, mammalian predators. Birds are a possibility, uh, hawks and things. Let me go to a more recent uh, invasion, an invasion that's occurring here in the States. I don't know, many of you may have seen this picture. It is a Burmese python that exploded, and that happens to be a alligator that it has swallowed. The National Geographic, this I took from the web, uh, and this, so this picture has been widely circulated. Some of you may have seen it. In point of fact, National Geographic uh, did a very nice special on what happened to that particular thing. And I'll allow you to look it up in National Geographic. They did a very nice storyline on it. Uh, 
how serious is the risk? Well, one of my colleagues uh, out of, in Colorado associated with invasive species, particularly with uh, the brown tree snake, is, has pointed out in a recent article where they did some modeling using climatic factors versus tolerance of the Burmese python, is, is that we could have Burmese python up here, or at least a little bit further south. Predictive, not that it is going to occur, but the modeling, that's a possibility. It's not an unattractive snake, but it does get to be a big one. The other thing that it does, anyone like to take a guess where that Burmese python was found? How about Iowa? Well, not that it naturally occurred there, but that's how Burmese pythons have gotten established in the glades. People having Burmese pythons buying them as small two, three foot snakes thinking they're pretty neat. Now they're getting up to six, seven feet. They're getting to be expensive to feed them all that little many dead rats or little peepees or something of that sort. So they release them. The other thing that has been suggested is, is that in addition to people releasing them in the canals that Hurricane Andrew, when it went through uh, southern Miami and the Homestead area, it basically flattened a lot of houses and released a lot of Burmese pythons and others. And of course, the Burmese python has been successful enough that it began breeding, and so that it's become established that way. But to give you an idea, in southern Florida, there are 65 species of non-native amphibians and reptiles. Most of them, if not exclusively, but let's say most of them come from people thinking it would be neat to have this lizard or this frog or this snake in their natural habitat. Is that not also what kind of the Cuban tree frog is taking over? Well, the, yeah, and, but in that case, I suspect the Cuban tree frog is one that got to Florida in much the same way that the brown tree snake did, in cargo and plants and things of that sort. And then there are those, but a lot of the things like the Cuban uh, king anole. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a great big anole that you can see when that was intentionally released. Anyway, the point of invasive species is, is that they are expensive. They are expensive to you and me because for their control we pay, wind up, our tax dollars go for that. So it's, you know, it's not a cute thing to do. The interesting thing, well, the uh, Cuban tree frog has been, in some areas, displaces the native frogs, and point of fact, it's big enough that it eats them. So it, that occurs, and uh, certainly the uh, Cuban sagrii anole has, uh, throughout much of Miami and such, uh, displaced uh, the native North American green anole. Okay, another aside, sorry. Uh, I pointed out that in Hawaii, you wind up and you're having 30 some odd species of amphibians and reptiles when there were none there. About 10 years ago, when my wife and I were visiting and working at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, the common lizard around the museum there was the North American anole from the east coast that had been imported into uh, Hawaii and had become well established. And in point of fact, it is reasonably well established uh, throughout the, all the Hawaiian islands. This year, when we were back working at the museum, no American anoles. The Cuban anole, the Sagrii, is now there because it's displaced the native, as just as it has displaced the native North American and all in southern Florida. Sorry. Let's talk about snake bite. First one thing I want to point out, we're dealing with snakes, we're dealing with venomous snakes, not poisonous. Just a quick definition of this, venom, bees, scorpions, snakes, things that inject their toxins are venomous. In other words, they're injecting a venom. That's the way the toxicologists use it. If you brush up against poison ivy or you consume uh, Clorox or something like that, you are poisoned. They are poisonous. 
So it's the difference, and it's a difference that actually is relatively recent when the toxicologists decided that they needed to differentiate between these things in the 1970s. Uh, just quickly, uh, venoms are a cocktail of all sorts of products, some of them toxins, but many of them are just normal body materials, compounds, and things like that. But in overdose, they wind up causing difficulties with normal physiological processes. Venoms are an adaptation, and in most cases, depending on what the snake is feeding on, the venom has been selected, has evolved within this group of snakes for a specific prey. Hence, some of the reasons why we are not bothered by certain of the venomous snakes when they bite is because they are used to preying on, say, insects or maybe frogs or something like that and not to a warm-blooded prey. Just quickly, if you're dealing with snake bites, we no longer cut and suck. You, what you do is you get the individual to a medical treatment and have doctors working there take care of it, but make certain also that when you get it to medical facility that you have that doctor call a poison control center so that they are talking to somebody who knows how to treat venomous snakes. You don't want a doctor who may have never seen a venomous snake by treating you without talking to a specialist with somebody that has, because you don't just strictly inject anti-venom into somebody. Now, clue here with the number of snake bites. A uh, colleague who is a tropical biologist uh, at the Tropical Medical Institute in England estimates that there's something on the order of uh, 50, where is it? Let me give you an exact number, not on the top of my head. Can't remember whether it's 50 or 500,000. 50,000 snake bite deaths a year in the world. It seems to me that that's a little high, but the whole point is, is there's lots of areas in Africa, Asia, South America, Central America where snake bites are not reported. So that's indeed a possibility. Within the United States, statistics aren't all that easy. But the whole point is, is here is a nearly a 20 year period and there are only 97 reported snake bites in the United States. Some of you have already started reading that, and I'm not going to read it to you. But I'll allow you to draw your conclusion from what it says there. That it was anticipated by an artist in the Washington Post three, four years before this was published. I think this came out in 99. This is in 2004. I just love that cartoon. It's, to my mind, it's the Bubba factor. And question. I wouldn't bet that that factor is in there as well, too. There is, I don't know if any of you have seen, uh, there is a, one of these things that circulate the web uh, that shows a young man sitting in a uh, wheelchair in Darwin, Australia. And I'm just trying to think, he has lost the lower part of one leg. Uh, his arm and such is on one side, it's all he and his buddies were out drinking Friday or Saturday night and they see the snake crossing the road and he's drunk enough that he obviously gets out to get it and in the process it bites him and bites him and bites him and he still kept it in his car. <laughs> I read that a couple guys down in Georgia, Florida somewhere came out of the bar one night found a rattlesnake in the parking lot and they were never playing catch with Oh, well, no, uh, as I say, uh, it's not what you would call high intelligence. <laughs> okay, question. What about handling? No, no, I mean, it's, it's 
snakes, uh, the scales are keratin. They're smooth, they're dry. Uh, it's not that the snake is not uh, secreting oils and waxes and things of that sort, but the, to the best of my knowledge, there is no snake that uh, you would get a reaction to. There are lots of frogs if you handle them. Uh, you're going to potentially get a skin reaction, and most particularly if you wind up touching your eye, you'll wind up with a burning sensation from their skin toxins. Not all frogs, but some. A lot of snakes should create a bunch of food that's self you would just be difficult to cope with. Well, yeah, but I mean, having been uh, gland, or it's a combination of feces and they have anal glands in the same area. And if you pick up a water snake, not only is it going to bite you, and if you're holding it tight enough, what it's also going to do is throw its tail around, and as soon as it gets itself around, it's going to just shower you with this very, very offensive smell. Well, obviously, that if you happen to be a, a fox and have a snake in your mouth, then starts wrapping around your head and at the same time throwing this stuff in your face, what are you going to do? Likely you're going to leave go. And so it is a defensive measure. Any other questions? No, go ahead. Just a quick question on the adaptation. We had a snake in the yard here a few weeks back. It wasn't a copper thing. No, it was a black snake on a farm. But it was cold. The weather was cold. And it was out. And is it not true that it gets pretty chilly that snakes do when you don't come out. They hibernate in the cold. But I noticed on this snake, it was embedded in the grass. We thought it was it had been hit by the mower or something, but it was actually alive. But I noticed its, it's head. It finally raised its head up after a while, and its eyes were, were bluish. What was, what was that all about? Uh, that was probably uh, the snake was being ready to shed. Okay. And what happens, well, easy enough. To see here with this snake. Snakes have no eyelids, but what they do have is part of a scale that's over the eye. It's called a spectacle because it's clear. And so when the snake sheds, that spectacle is taken off. But the, pro and the process of shedding is sort of a multi step thing. And one of the first things that occurs, and this is well prior to shedding, is, is that the outer layer of the epidermis and the skin lifts off, not high, and it fills up with the fluid. It doesn't require much, but obviously there's this, there's always a scale over the eye. And when it's getting ready to shed, the entire skin becomes loose, that solution fluid's underneath. Obviously it's between the old spectacle and the new one. And so what you're seeing is, is this opaque color. So Depending what the color of the eye is, you look like. And then what happens is that disappears shortly after that, and the skin dries sufficiently enough so that it can break, fall out of the skin. The uh, picture we had earlier of the garden snake that was along the wall is it true that the rattle snake cannot fight? I think that's sort of like telling me a water moccasin. You can't bite you at the water. Okay. No. Uh, the point is, is it is going to have to extend itself. But whether it would, well, I know point of fact because there have been colleagues who have been bitten by snakes and they've been holding the snake. So obviously it didn't strike. It just sort of reached around and got at least one thing. No, there's a snake in Africa called, what's the group snake? Stiletto vipers. Uh, and what they have is they're subterranean, they're burrow, and they feed largely on animals, and they feed largely on uh, litters from mice and things of that sort. But if you're underground, obviously you can't strike, and you can't throw yourself forward, and they have very long fangs. And so what they do is they, slide into the burrow where they find the litter or mice or whatever is there. And then they literally put the dolls inside, one fine comes out, and then they yank themselves back and inject the 
found that way. And of course, there are many herpetologists and non herpetologists who pick up this supposedly innocuous looking snake and pick it up properly right behind the head. And the problem being, is this particular snake, you just know that draw to the side and nail you anyway. <laughs> so you handle snakes carefully. You had another question? Yeah, I was going to, you know, uh, the, the black bat snakes in this area, around here, you know, they, in the spring times, when they first come out of hibernation, they have a lot of focus. And a lot of it's around their face and their mouth. And uh, sometimes it's so bad that their mouth is like swollen, you know, like it's partially open. And they, to, to kill the fungus, they, they like to they get out in the sun, and they stay in the sun as much as they can. But if it's like, if they come out on a warm day, and then it gets cold, they can't find their way. There's a bit of so much stuff that the fungus does. Okay, that's something so that I'm you, totally not familiar with. He, he, I, this I one he saw, you know, I would think it's probably came out there, and, and then it got cold, and it, it just stayed there. No, 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 that's true. I mean, that's true of box turtles and other things, that when you have these warm winter time days, and stuff, things come out. And if it drops, the temperature drops too quickly, you, you came out at the wrong time. Bam. And do uh, snakes have uh, stomach acid like other Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, no, th I mean, that's true even down through fishes and things of that sort. There, there has to be acids, enzymes that help right. digest the food. Yes, sir. In regards to fishes, you mentioned they have some food. Do you know that there's a specific range? That data is probably available, but it's not available in the back <laughs> Now, the, what, and this is sort of dredging up the old knowledge of how well I remember the knowledge. But my impression is, is that the cones that they have in space are actually modified rods. The word, this is used to point out that it's likely that when snakes evolve, they evolve as terrestrial burrowing animals and lost the cones, which were the thin sort of color vision. And then when they then sort of back up and diversify, they use the rods in an evolutionary sense to create a <coughs> cone to sharpen your vision. So perhaps the cones are for sharper black and white vision? They're sh for sharper vision, yeah. Yeah, and the point is, is that as far as I know, and I think I have an idea on this, they only have one visual pigment, which means that there isn't any color because you have to contrast the whole thing. So yeah, sharper black and white vision. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to charge you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a free lunch. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much.